Okay, well, Jim wrangles the robot. Um, I'm going to explain that this is going to be a three-sided conversation. It's going to be Jim, it's going to be myself, and it's going to be Vigilus with his robot's perspective on what we're saying. Clearly, one of the things that we've discovered over a couple of years of this is the problem with autonomous robots is that they're autonomous. <laughs> and that means they do what they think is the appropriate thing to do, whether that's what we want or not. All right, let's see if we can make this go. Wow, did good. So I'm going to be, as part of this discussion, I'm going to be covering the systems viewpoint, how robots are going to fit into systems, how robots have to change, and whether we're going to have to change to work with them. Since my background's in computer science and AI, I'm going to focus more on the hows and the whats and the whys of putting brains in robots to enable them to get out of the laboratories, to enable them to get out of uh, industrial settings and get into people's houses and workplaces and offices. It's an interesting challenge. And make sure you're on Vigilus. Vigilus, what are you going to do? My name is Vigilus, and while they try to articulate their viewpoints, I will give you the only perspective that matters. The perspective of the robot. <laughs> I don't think it's working. Uh, cool. Okay. Yeah. So, we're going to start with a little history, because we don't know where we're going until we know where we've been. This is Electro and Sparky. 1939 World's Fair. We have clearly wanted robots forever. Something like a robot shows up in Homer's Odyssey and the Iliad, where they made robots to serve drinks to the gods. So the question is, why don't we have a robot yet? And some of it is technology. When you look at these guys, Sparky and Electro, Electro actually spoke, much like Vigilus, listened and answered appropriately. That was being done with 78 RPM records. And the voice recognition was being done with vacuum tubes that were basically powered off of this system. Our technology has improved a lot. Vigilus, what do you think? Vigilus, wake up. You humans have talked about robots for thousands of years. You really need robots, so where are they? So the question of where are they? Um, the technology side of it, we have gotten really, really good. Moore's Law, probably everyone is familiar with it, doubling the chip or the transistor density on chips every 18 months. There have been a lot of 18-month windows since the 1940s. That helps us tremendously, and that brings <laughs> low-cost computational power into our hands right now. You can buy a chip the size of your fingertip that has the processing power of a Cray-1 supercomputer, and it'll cost you about six bucks. This makes for a lot of capability that enables us to build smarter robots and bring them out of the labs. And also, we really need them now. We need them in ways we haven't before. The population is aging. Many people have gotten accustomed to the privacy of living by themselves. Right they don't want to live with their kids or their grandkids. They want robots. So that's really pushing the demand. And there have been a number of studies recently indicating that that's exactly what people want. There was a documentary filmed over the course of the last year that asked kids, what do you see as the future? And some of them talked about jet cars. <laughs> If they had done that study 50 years ago, they still would have talked about jet cars. Some of them talked about, about uh, living in space. Every single one of them said they were going to be living with robots. I think he has a comment. Yep. Vigilus, your turn. Let us talk about the robots that are already everywhere. The industrial robots. So we've already got robots. Um, this is uh, what we're living with right now. The auto industry is almost entirely robotic at this point. 
the big problem with that is, well, Nigelit, what's the problem with, with robots? Of course, the limiting factor is that these robots are dumbass posts. So they have to be handled carefully, or they will make mistakes. They have had people in the past, even in carefully controlled factory settings. You do not want one of these in your house, until it is smart like me. <laughs> now, and we've done this before. This is the third industrial revolution. We've done two. We know what it's going to look like. We know what it's going to feel like. So, people who want to know what's coming should look at the last two industrial revolutions. But they're pretty disruptive. Yeah, they're very disruptive. They will eat jobs, and new jobs will be made. A lot of displacement. We've got big problems now because we have the ability to produce so much stuff so cheaply and so quickly that we don't know what to do with the stuff that we are producing. We are now dealing with situations that you couldn't imagine 100 years ago, psychoses and neuroses associated with the acquisition of cheap, cheap stuff that we can't get rid of. These are big social problems that are coming out of an industrial revolution of that magnitude, and we're going to see types of issues like that as we move robots into dealing with people on a regular basis. But to do it, the robots have to be smart. So a couple years ago, like six, Jim said, you study biology, how hard can it be? The dog can do it. And um, I basically said, look, you, if, what, the problem with code is you can't write code, you can't develop software unless you know what it is that you're coding. If you can't write it down, you can't write it into a program. So he handed it to me, and a year later, we had a model. And that's the model we've coded to. It's a reasonably faithful representation of a vertebrate brain. That's the same kind of brain that we're running. Uh, so, go. However, part of the problem with that is it's not just the brain. Brains are really important. But what's important also is the ability to plan, um, the ability to work in the real world. So you have to use that brain for something. Vigilus? Vigilus, how's your brain? Robot, how's your brain? My brain is really advanced. It runs like clockwork. No, it runs even better than clockwork. And that's a key issue because clockwork is mechanistic. It does the same thing over and over again. In order to work in the real world, the real world is constantly changing, and we need to have brains that can adapt to those changes. So there's been some incredibly cutting-edge development in AI that has enabled us to move there we go. To move robots to the point where they can think and reason in the same manner, not the same way, and certainly not at the same level, but in the same manner, a familiar manner, as a human being. Because we need them. As I said before, we need them to live with us. We need them to help us, to protect us. And maybe we can learn from them. And that brings us to the next problem, which is that if they're going to live with us, they have to understand us. We are used to living with things that get us. We live with dogs. Dogs build a theory of how you're going to behave. Dogs they, can manipulate us really well. Yeah, yeah that's how they get fed. Um, dogs have a, a rudimentary theory of our behavior. So we need to give the robots what's technically called a theory of mind. They need to be able to understand how we're thinking or they're not going to work well with us. And One of the side effects of that is people have a tendency to want to personify inanimate objects anyway. But if you have an inanimate object and it acts like a person and it works with you like a person and it relates to you like a person, it's very easy to start thinking of it like a person, and then you start to build relationships. You start to build relationships like trust, which is very important, but you can also start to build other types of relationships that may not be the most beneficial types of relationships. So this is a potential problem. 
And if it's going to work, they're going to have to be able to build relationships of us. And that leads us to the most interesting problem. If, they're, if they have a vertebrate brain, with all the pieces of a vertebrate brain, and they've been given the ability to build a theory of mind, are they conscious? And if they're conscious, what does that mean? What does that mean for us living? Do they have rights? And I think another side of that is, well, Vigilus, what kind of work are you going to be doing? That is the kind of job that I am designed to do, to help people live better lives assisted by affordable, reliable, helpful robots. So I got a question for you, Vigilus. What happens if the person that you're helping decides that you're not needed anymore? Vigilus, what happens then? Do you have rights? So I have an important question to ask. If we do have conscious robots, robots with goals and intentions and desires, if I were a self-aware robot, would you have the right to turn me off? And that's the question we're leaving you with. We'd really like TED Talks because we want questions that are need, need answers to be answered. And it's not up to us, and it's not up to the technology. It's the questions that get answered are going to drive the technology. The questions that get answered are going to drive what we live with in the future. So we're just going to leave this with questions rather than answers and get Vigilus off the stage. So thank you.